What's up, guys? Welcome to episode number eight of Sir Kevin Says. Thank you guys for joining. Before I get to anything else, uh, I know I'm really late, but Happy New Year and Merry Christmas to all. Hopefully it was uh, some awesome holidays for you guys. Today on episode number eight, I sit down with Amado Ruiz, who is a former instructor of mine. Amado is a Grammy-nominated pianist, keyboardist, and arranger from Venezuela and a resident of L.A. for the last 30 years. Amado has toured most recently um, with Randy Brecker and Bill Evans Sobop. Simon Phillips Protocol 4, and with Billy Cobham. Keeping versatility as his biggest asset, Mr. Ruiz has performed from Latin jazz with Arturo Sandoval uh, and Tito Puente to rock and pop with Robbie Robertson and Gino Vanelli. And then also from Straight Ahead Jazz as Diane Reeves' musical director, uh, Frank Morgan and Billy Higgins' quartet to the most exciting fusion with John McLaughlin, Frank and Bali, and the band Protocol. Armado has five solo CD releases and in the local LA scene has participated in many recordings and film soundtracks. I got to study with Armado um, a couple of years ago at Cornell School of Music uh, and we specifically covered the style of music called Fusion. I, I learned so much from him and I'm sure you guys are going to also. In today's episode you will see some demonstrations that he makes uh, concerning rhythm. Uh, really cool stuff. Hopefully you guys will enjoy it. And uh, without further ado, episode number eight. Check it out. Welcome to episode number eight of Sir Kevin Says. Today I'm here with Ormado Ruiz, uh, virtuoso piano player from Caracas, Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with you, Ormado. Thank you so much for Thank dedicating you for some having time. Me. Thank you. How are you doing, Ormado? It's been great, man. Yeah? It's what good to see you. Again. Same here, same here. It's been a couple, uh, more than a year now, right? More than a year, yeah. yeah. Since the school situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what have you been up to, Ormado, these days? Uh, I've been uh, concentrating on working on um, my sideman, some sideman situations that I have. Okay. Um, first with uh, Simon Phillips. Nice. Uh, yes. The band called Protocol. Protocol, right. Uh, so that was a very challenging project that I picked last year, actually in two thousand, end of 2017. Um, it's great music and I took of the challenge uh, to you know dive into something I hadn't, I hadn't done in a long time, which yes. is like a full, uh, more aggressive rock fusion yeah. kind of thing. And um, also uh, working on the pre-production of our next album with uh, my wife, Katina, nice. which was nominated for a Grammy in 2016. Nice. So now we're already working on the new album. Uh, in the pre-production, the arrangements. And um, I just uh, released a trio album with Jimmy Bradley and Jimmy Haslip. Awesome. Of our, you know, our pro project called Elemental. And uh, that's, that has been a lot of fun, getting it recorded, but also, you know, the whole process of, of, of working with those Two guys is, is great. Yes. They're amazing people, amazing musicians, but also amazing, great people, great yeah. friends. So it's been a lot of fun. Nice, nice. And uh, the uh, the new album that you're doing with Jimmy Haslip and Jimmy Branley, what, what style of music is that? Well, originally, that's uh, uh, an idea that Branley had. Okay. Um, we, well, about three years ago, we had a, we wanted to put together this band. Uh, it was more. It was a quintet. Uh, it had a horn and uh, horns and, and percussion too. And we wanted to do something like really, really happening, like kind of like uh, uh, do a Latin version of of our favorite bands, like you know, Weather Report, sure. but like with a Latin twist yeah. or Yellow Jackets with a with a Latin twist. There's this gap still, you know, sure. that uh, that we thought we could fill. 
and um, we work on this project, but it, it, it couldn't gel at the end. Uh, uh, we, we couldn't get the support needed from record labels or from management. And, and uh, that kind of like stayed there on the on the side for a yeah. while. And then Jamie Bradley had this idea of doing a trio. Mm. Let's do a trio, something really like that we can have more control over. And, um, and the music was already done because we had this other project of course, two years of course, ago. Yeah. So I just had to re uh, revamp it and, uh, and reorganize it and adjust it, you know, uh, to trio format. And uh, it's, it's great. It's, 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 a, it's a fusion project uh, with uh, uh, acoustic organic instruments okay. and some electronics, of course, but, but the core of the project is based on just the performance of a real instrument, a real acoustic piano, a real Fender Rhodes. Nice. Uh, and then it's, uh, I'm very, very pleased with the results. So. Awesome. Did you guys record this at uh, Jimmy's studio? We did, yeah, the the the, um, the basic tracking, uh, okay. all the the uh, the foundation trio tracking was done at Jim, at Jimmy's studio. Awesome. And then, but however, you know, he doesn't have an acoustic piano, so <laughs> everything, everything, all the uh, the acoustic piano, Fender, real Fender Rhodes, we had to redo here. Oh. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. It was you know, logistically. Too demanding to, yeah, be carrying all this. Of course, thing. yeah, no. yeah. So we had to do it in the two studios. But I mean, the the, the performances, uh, drum and bass, was captured. Awesome. In his studio with nice. me playing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Now, Armando, uh, I want to take it back uh, to the very beginning with you. So you were born in Caracas, Venezuela. Yes. How did you know, how did you go from being in Venezuela to coming to the U.S.? How did your musical passion begin? At what age? Um, oh, well, um, I was, I started the music at a very early age. Um, eight years old, probably, yeah, wow. eight, seven. Um, in our countries, Latin American countries are very musical driven countries, yes, you know. Yes. And everybody in Latin America can play some kind of instrument. Right. So um, when I was a kid, I, I was playing the folk, our folk little guitar called the Cuatro, um, which is like an ukulele. And uh, that's how most Venezuelans started music, <laughs> either with a drum or a cuatro. <laughs> so um, I played cuatro for years, and, and, uh, and then I decided to become a guitar player. Our system of, ed of education, musical education, is... Uh, borrowed and modeled to the uh, French system. Mm, okay. So the French conservatory system is a long, long process. It's 10 years. Uh, so you enter the conservatory roughly at age eight or nine. Okay. And then you graduate when you are 19, mm. you know, basically. Uh, so that's what I did. I, I started the conservatory when I was eight and I picked... Uh, classical guitar as my instrument, okay. and that's the instrument that I started for the whole duration of my conservatory years. Of course, all the theory, harmony, history, aesthetics, uh, uh, and um, when I was in my last year of of, uh, of classical guitar, uh, previous to my last graduation concert, I had already been toying around with uh, keyboards, you know, yeah. organ. I had participated in some uh, national uh, competitions and uh, and I realized that the, the relationship that I had with the keyboards was more immediate and mm -hmm. more natural than with the acoustic guitar. Yeah. And it was kind of like a sad realization after so many years <laughs> I, I mean you know you yeah. i mean because i was a very good student i was yes. but i i couldn't i couldn't have that relationship with the instrument sure. i realized wow it's like with the keyboards it was immediate yeah. and then you know i i just went that way so, so like a love at first sight kind of exactly deal. imagine yeah. imagine well i mean i hate to make the analogy but imagine <laughs> you have this 
girlfriend for a long time. <laughs> And then you realize, wow, I don't like her that yeah, much, you know. Yeah. I like this other guy. It was very, but I'm, I always say that the only place where affairs have a, are healthy is in music and <laughs> arts. In arts, you can have as many affairs as you want. Actually, it's healthy, you know. Uh, so, yeah, because affairs in art, whatever ignites your curiosity yeah. makes you richer right. as an artist. Right. Right. So... So that's what I did. I mean, I uh, I dropped the, the acoustic guitar altogether wow. um, and became a, a keyboardist, pianist. I, of course, I was I had to kind of like work double time because sure, sure. I had to get my technique back, you know, up to certain standards. Right. And uh, and uh, well, I became a, a popular pianist and I started um, touring uh, with many of the national uh, you know the talent from Venezuela I was also studying in the university because I, was, I wanted to be a scientist like my parents so I studied biology and it's the same thing you know towards the end uh, I had already studied three and a half years of the career of the bachelor's in biology and I realized well what am I going to be doing I mean some of the assignments were so so demanding mm -hmm. in terms of time and sometimes we would need to go and start collecting specimens you know in some remote location it's like i wouldn't see a piano or an instrument for days you wow. know so it's like uh, what am i doing here you know am i going to really become a biologist or so that's another thing that i dropped you know i like i had like a total change of <laughs> of of, of heart yeah, you know yeah, yeah. uh when i decided okay i'm going to be just a pianist and then I dropped the acoustic guitar, the classical guitar, and, and the biology. And then I became a, a popular pianist. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say more popular pianist than jazz pianist. Because in Venezuela, um, like in so many Latin American countries, uh, I don't know anybody that can say I'm a jazz player, a jazz player or a rock player. We are an everything player. Yeah. In our countries, you have to play all kinds of, of course, music. You know? Of course. Uh, so, that was the the best training I could get because uh, I really grew up uh, liking all kinds of stuff. You know, it's not like I had to. It's like that's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. You grow up uh, playing Caribbean music, or you grow at the same time. You have to go and play a rock and roll gig and and then you go to a jazz club every night and then so that was that was what I was doing mm. and then I started um, I partnered with uh, perhaps the, the the most important uh, TV and radio jingles produ production company okay uh, towards the last few years I was there uh, and I started writing commercials and commercials and commercials and it was back then it was a daily it was a daily business okay it's not like uh, here in the united states you, you know the commerce the tv convert jingle uh, business is something that you do one today and then maybe if you're lucky one next yeah. week or right. or one a month one, yeah. one a month uh there back then it was daily so it was a great training because i was paid to write music in so many different formats. And we use real orchestras, we use real strings, we use real horns. Wow. Uh, and every commercial was a different style. So it was really great, you know, to, it's like, wow, it cannot get any better than this. I'm being paid, paid great. And uh, and I get to, to use what I'm practicing, I get to, to to see how it sounds, you know, uh, so that's that was my my training in terms of arrangement and and of course financially it helped me a lot. What happened is that uh, uh, at some point I was so young still I was in my early twenties, and uh, I I had another one of these crude realizations. It's like well I'm early 20s, I'm getting all this money, and, and what? Mm -hmm. Then what? You know? 
and I want to stay behind a desk because that that uh, that job is is more like an office thing. It's like a desk thing than yeah. than anything. Else. I mean, you are a corporate. Yeah, I mean, I was like going around from studio to studio and for, to production meetings with a briefcase and, <laughs> and all this. So I realized I'm not gonna st I'm not gonna be that so early in life. So um, a friend of mine told me, he's like, man, let's check out California. Let's go, let's do a little trip and see what what is what is out there, you know. And then uh, I came, I went to first Miami, and we went to New York, and searching for places, and and then I fell in love with this place here in in, the United States, in California called Cal Arts, because of the location, because of the weather, mm -hmm. but also because what the school could offer, which was a total um, open program to to grow, you know. Sure. Uh, I, I always thought that Cal Arts was a place where if you knew what you wanted, it would like just make your brain explode into so many possibilities, mm -hmm. you know, and make you grow. So that's what I did. And then I, I left everything. Again, another... <laughs> <laughs> another change of art yeah. and then I left the corporate uh, lifestyle behind again and came back and started from zero again and uh, the rest is history so what year did you get uh, to California and, and officially stay uh, the first time I came was in 87 okay uh, but then I, I stayed for a while uh, and uh, I kind of secured you know all the little details and then I went back Work, uh, work two more years. Mm -hmm. Again, making money with the commercials, yeah. like raking in as much uh, funds as I could, and uh, I came in early '89. '89. Yeah. Okay. And so, would you say your your professional career? Uh, I, I mean, from what you're telling me, it would seem that your professional career started in Venezuela, right? And it just yeah, continued totally. here in, yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. How, how did you go about connecting with uh, musicians, you know, the ones that you know now, Luis Conte, yeah. um, you know, Jimmy Branley, all these individuals that are so successful uh, mm -hmm. and are known, especially here in, in, in L.A., how did you go about connecting with them? How did you start meeting them? Well, um, as they say, it's uh, being at the right place at uh, <laughs> the right time, right? Yeah. Well, in my case, I can tell you it was the most amazing planetary alignment <laughs> <laughs> event because the same day I arrived in 89, April 89, um, was, or was it in 80? No, it wasn't 89, yeah. The same day I arrived, a friend of mine was graduating, was playing his graduation recital okay. in Calarts. So pretty much we went from the airport, we left the, the luggage in, in our apartment, and then he told me, okay, we have to go, I have to play tonight. You know, So I went to uh, accompany him, and uh, in the program they were playing one of my tunes, and then I was in the audience, and uh, he wanted to surprise me and invited me to play with him, awesome. which was great, yeah. you know. So yeah. I played, and in the band, the drummer was Alex Acuna. <laughs> so that same night, I made Alex, yeah. and uh, and Alex told me, "Man, let's play together," and that was it. That's incredible. So, yeah, it, it's uh, it was a. <laughs> And then Alex, I'm assuming Alex God introduced given. you to everybody else afterward. He he started to introduce you to all his friends. Exactly, and, yeah. yeah. I, I started playing with Alex's band right at that moment. We, like, clicked. Yeah. Uh, and uh, immediately we started playing with his band, which is, was called uh, The Unknowns. And was that, sim uh, I, I, I'm sorry, was that Tolu? No, the unknowns. The unknowns. Okay. Uh, I play with Tolu too. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. because of of the association of Alex with with Gusto Mario. Got it. Okay. But Alex's band, which I think still is the greatest Latin <laughs> Latin fusion band sure, sure. ever. Yeah. There's nothing. 
yeah. that ever sounded like that. Right, right. And still, there's a gap, uh, which is what we wanted to 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 fill, you know, with this quintet thing that we. Uh, Alex's band uh, was uh, with uh, Ramon Stagnaro, Richie Gatti Garcia, originally with Efrain Toro, per on percussion as well, uh, John Pena on bass, yeah. Pedro Stach on flute, and uh, myself. Originally, it was uh, Joe Rotondi on okay. keyboards. Uh, so it was it was a great, great band. It was like... Alex wanted to 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 play all that energy that he, all that sound that he knew from Weather Report yeah. that he got so you know so down, but I mean it's like let's do this uh, in a Latin way. Let's yeah. see what we come up with, and then you know we stayed with that band for twenty years. You know, incredible. Yeah, yeah, I think I I remember seeing you guys. Um, I don't know what Nam show it was at, but it was a couple of years ago. You guys did like a saving event. Was that the unknowns or? Uh, let's see. It was a, it was a, you. They rented a big room and it was you were on keys. It was Alex on 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 drums. I I can't remember the whole band, but I think Harry Kim was playing too. Um, um but I don't remember. We did uh, uh we disbanded quite a few years ago. Um, but we did some kind of like reunion gigs sure. here and there. I think that's a that's a, uh, a concert we did with uh, Victor Wooten. Oh, okay. I think he was on bass and Alex. Uh, man, it was a while like, ago. Yeah, it was yeah. while, I can't remember yeah. what 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 uh, Nam show it was, but I remember it, I, I I got to see you guys. Um, you know, in fact, a lot of the Latin community showed up to support. You know, which was awesome. Uh, yeah. You know, watching you guys perform, uh, but I can't remember what what Nam Trey was specifically. But yeah, um, Ormado, what would you say is one of the things that drives you the most when it comes to music? What What do you say continues to push you to keep doing this as long as you have? Uh, well, that's a great, uh, <laughs> great question. Uh, and uh, let's see, there's there's something that I. I heard a friend of mine say once that kind of like gave me. Well, you know, I didn't know what to make out, of, what to make out of it. He said, "I mean, there there are artists that keep changing all the time, and there are artists that are themselves or all, all the time. Okay, they just remain the same. You yeah. Know? Uh, and then he kind of hinted that." Through the years, I've always, I've always had the same personality, you know. So, <laughs> at the moment, I, f I felt like, hmm, should I be the one that keeps like, I I've never been a, a a friend of these trend seekers, you know. Yeah. Because I see that happening too much. Sure. Artists that are like, oh, now I'm gonna be doing a little bit of this, right? Uh, because it's it's hip now, or now I'm gonna do an album with. Uh, with the bachata because I mean, that's what's, you know, <laughs> I've never been able to think like that, yeah. you know. I just have music that, my music reflects who I am and who are uh, all the luggage that I, all the cultural luggage that I, that I have. Yeah. And, and that's, that's my personality and I keep reflecting it through it. I mean, I'm not, Really thinking what is hip, what is gonna sell, what is not gonna sell. Mm, okay, so you, you stay true to who you are, essentially. Exactly, yeah. you know. So, so yeah. um, uh, to people that are that are expecting big changes, all I can say is, I'm sorry, I don't, I haven't changed. You know, <laughs> I'm yeah. the same guy. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but it, it does change. I mean, I see. I mean, if you take for example, my the first album that I did here uh, from 91 and you compare it to what I just released with Jimmy Brownlee. Yeah. I mean, there's this, this, a, this a change, of, of course. course. I mean, we keep learning, we keep uh, uh, incorporating new new things into our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the essence is still there. I've been always a very 
uh, for instance, uh, when I do music, I am very visual. Be perhaps because of all those years working for TV, mm. I, I I I see images. I I write a song. I never write a song called like I'm gonna write just a song. No, it's a song about something that I'm seeing, a, a story, something that happened to me, Got it. a person that influenced me. Uh, um, or, or I tried to capture the personality for, or like, when I wrote the song for uh, the song for my father, for instance, when when he passed, it was about that. It's like, man, it's like, what can I, can I really grab, what his influence in my life, mm. sounds in music. Yeah, I try to do it as honest as possible. Um, and and that's that's how I operate, you know. Uh, and uh, regardless of how sof more sophisticated harmony I use or not, I I still, in essence, try to convey just an honest uh, depiction of, of of myself. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. When I was at Shepherd uh, studying under you, you know, you have this approach. Um, to teaching as well, you know, you you want your students to to learn. You want your students mm. to to grasp what it is. Um, you know, the style of music we were covering is was fusion at the yeah, time at, at yeah. Cornell, um, and I remember um, there was a specific class uh, where we had this. I think it was a Brazilian bass player, and we were learning Butterfly mm. um, by Her uh, Herbie Hancock, I believe, yeah. and uh, he was struggling with the song. Mm -hmm. For a while, you know, he 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 couldn't get. I think uh, it's a, it's after like a sixteen bar interlude or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, hit counting, on beat two. Yeah, counting, yeah, yeah. So I remember one of the classes. You you know you uh, you needed to leave, and so you you looked at me uh, and you said, Kevin, um, I need to go. I you know I have another. I think you had like another course to yeah, go yeah. cover. Um, he needs to have this down by next week. So make sure that, you know, <laughs> make sure that he does. <laughs> and so I remember looking around, I was like, Armado, but like, I'm not even the teacher's assistant. And so I felt like a little bit of like a weight on me. I was like, man, I feel, I feel like I don't want to let you down. You know, mm -hmm. do you feel when it comes to your students, you don't want to let them down when you teach them, even if it's something that maybe they're bored of or something that they don't want to learn. You, you say, you know, this is what's essential and what's important. For, for your growth as a musician, do you feel that way too when you teach? Of course. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, you know, I, uh, all, all, everything that I've done in life comes from my, my, my awareness of, of what, uh, what needs, what you need to have mm -hmm. in order to be free. Yeah. You cannot just be free without knowing the parameters of what freedom is. Right. 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 Uh, so when it comes to music, it's no difference, no different than regular life. I mean, we put so much emphasis in literacy. Why? Because literacy frees you. Mm. Free, uh, you. you you, the more you learn, the more you know how much out there it is, you know. And the best way to learn is through, through reading, through you know, knowledge, you know, yes. acquiring knowledge. Right. That's there's no way uh, around it. So in music, is no different. Uh, you you can be you know your goal in life can be being an avant-garde player. That's great. I mean, total like no boundaries. But still, you need to know what boundaries you're gonna break. Right, right. You know, so that's where reading, harmony, uh, aesthetics, history come come in to 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 help you like create this this foundation that you're gonna depart from. Yeah. You know, um, so when it comes to uh, to for instance that that thing that you that you. That uh, his that story <laughs> from the class is because when when you're working in an ensemble, uh, sometimes you are not going to work with the, the most prepared people, mm. 
and um, believe me, you can be a superstar and not be prepared for a certain situation. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to That's do. It doesn't have to do with level of proficiency. Being prepared is is, is something that will you will have to face all through your career, whether yeah. you're a mega star or not. You have to do homework. You will always have to do homework, right? So uh, when you are in a, in a, in, in a bandstand, which is something that I, you know, happens to me all the time, sometimes uh, I wish the band was more supportive. Uh, and And that's what music is about when you do ensemble work. I mean, it's not like, I know my part, hmm. don't bother me, yeah. I know my part. It's not about that. Sometimes you know your stuff, and then, but there's, you, your duty is to make everybody sound yeah. as best as possible. Right. So if there's someone that is struggling, if there's someone that is not hitting that, that break on the second beat or whatever, I mean, if it happens the first time, or you know, wow, as a drummer, for instance, you would, or as a keyboard player, I would go like, mm, chances are the second time, he's not gonna get it, <laughs> yeah, because you 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 can see how space or how I mean, if he doesn't really know, you can read the body gesture right. of, of, of the musician, you know, when they are like, wow, what was going on? It's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how can I help? Yeah. That. So that's that's what I meant with just yeah. like make sure that because it's very easy for you or for a musician when you know when you when you're counting bars and you know it's coming to have visual con contact do like a little fill and do like like a hand gesture there's so many yeah. ways that you can exactly bring that person back right. in you know and that's our sacred duty when yeah. you're doing ensemble work it's not for you it's yeah. for the music yeah right yeah when you cover classes about reading how how much do you emphasize that you know because we're we're in a society today where a lot of people will say that reading music is not as important as it used to be uh mm -hmm. what would you say about that in you know regarding today ah uh, well it <laughs> i mean again you go in the internet right now that's something that is happening a lot and i'm sure you have seen it there's this new information bit called the meme, right? <laughs> yeah. Now everybody is <laughs> our instant philosophers. <laughs> everybody became like instant thinkers because yeah. just because they learn a meme, right? And they repeat that thing like deep words. And nobody knows, nobody has words of their own. Mm. They just repeat and repeat, you know, something like a little capsule of knowledge, yeah? Uh, and that's the new, it seems to be the new reality of knowledge, right? Uh, in music, that might be happening too. Why? Because in music, technology has made available many ways of doing product, mm. of coming up with product that allows you to bypass all these theory thing yeah. uh, there's there's software that creates chords chord I mean you you feed a chord the chord you want and then it gives you all these different possibilities of that chord so you don't even have to learn voices or anything anymore but then it's it's it's, it's a matter of what is really important what is important as a as a as an essential thing. I mean, I think knowledge, liter literacy is yeah. is where it's at, you know, yeah. regardless uh, of, of, of what style of music you're going to be doing. Right. Um, because eventually, it's going to be you and a piece of paper at some point. Okay. Eventually, you'll be in a position where you don't have your computer or or you're gonna be um, in in a band stand and you don't have your favorite sequence. Yeah. So you will have to face 
reality. They are with a pencil, paper. So why not? I mean, I, I, I've never been a friend of shortcuts, you know. Yeah. And I love technology too. Uh, but this should be a marriage of, of two. The ideal, the ideal is a marriage of the two, of, of the freedom and using the available uh, technology, the, 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 the facility that technology uh, allows us to have nowadays, but to have control, to command that through our knowledge rather than right. be at the mercy of whatever it, it, it allows us to do. You yeah. know? What style of music would you say uh, is, is something that should be uh, maybe catapulted a bit more than it is now, that is, many people are not aware of? What style of music would you say most people should be hearing to grow? Well, personally, I think it's a pity I'm not, by the way, I'm not biased towards jazz uh, because I don't consider myself a jazz player either. Um, I like the element of freedom that jazz provides. I like the, the, the fact that jazz is a style of music that promotes thinking. Yeah both from the performer and from the audience. Yeah. I like that. It's like good cinema versus blockbuster cinema, right? Got it. It's like when you go to the movie to see, I don't know, Fast and Furious, and then you go and see an European film that, wow, you leave the theater, your heart is like, wow, <laughs> like filled with all this emotion. That's that's how I think about that, that, that jazz brings to the table. It's, is is the way to to enable you to make music with substance and make it available to the audience and educate the audience and bring everybody to higher a higher place, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm like a hard, you know, hardcore fanatic of jazz only. Yeah, uh, I've always been critical that jazz can become a very cerebral, intellectual art form, especially mm -hmm. nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where rock, for instance, takes the, <laughs> takes predominance because, because rock is all about emotion. It's, it's all about bringing people to ecstasy through <laughs> playing less, less notes. So if you if you see that happen, you were like, well, how can they do that? You know, how how come a jazz player knows all these scales, and he's playing all these scales, and and he cannot bring that level of emotion from yeah. an audience? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's so many things that we can learn from so many different styles, but I say it's a pity that jazz doesn't have a. a more acceptance, acceptance in in as an art form. Being the only, well, as they say, the only true cultural manifestation of the United States, right, right, rock and roll and jazz, mm -hmm. right. So it it you know it should have a a, a better place. Yeah. Uh, but again, I, I put some of the blame on jazz musicians themselves because if you want to make it such a, a unique, exclusive club of thinkers, then you have to deal with smaller audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very true. Yeah. That's very true. Your uh, your approach to practicing um, earlier when I was setting up all the equipment, you were doing, you were tapping this thing. I don't know what, what it is you were doing, but you were, it sounded like you were doing, uh, some polyrhythms or, or some, of some sort. <laughs> you know, I have, I, there's a, a friend of mine that told me that he went to go see you at a show and he, he, he was telling me, man, Omar is so amazing. He was playing a rhythm, like a, something in four, four, but adding like a, it was like five against four or something like that. <laughs> You're very known for doing that as well. How do you go about practicing those things? You know, polyrhythms, uh, all time signatures. What are some things that you listen to or what has 
helped you grow your vocabulary when it comes to practicing, um, you know, these time signatures or, or polyrhythms? Or? Uh, well, um, that's one of the reasons why, for instance, I took the gig with Simon Phillips. Yeah. Because I put myself always in a situation in which I have to work for it. That's good. You know? So, um, most of the jobs I take, I take because I know I can do it. Sometimes I take the jobs because I want to know that I can do them. <laughs> <laughs> I can do them. Yeah. So, so in the case of Simon, I kn I knew I had, I I had the, you know the. When it comes to the harmonic thing, the vibe of, of fusion, I had already been in situations, you know, yeah. where I had to play that raw, raw thing, you know. Uh, it's more closer to rock than jazz, basically, yeah. you know. Uh, now, Simon is a master of, of, of odd meters. And uh, so I have not been in a situation like that since I played with John McLaughlin in, in the late 90s. And I needed that. I needed like to, to okay. I mean, uh, I'm uh, to f refocus it into into working on this again. Yeah. Uh, now it's the way I do it when I when I play like in, in regular situations, like in jazz situations. Um, basically, what I do is I draw. Uh, I, I draw from my cultural uh, knowledge again, mm -hmm. and this is perhaps the the most important thing that I can tell any aspiring musician or artist is embrace embrace your cultural knowledge, your cultural heritage. Don't be ashamed of it. Uh, Regard it doesn't mean I mean if you come from a place where they have this little rhythm that nobody knows, it's okay. Don't be ashamed of that. Yeah. You can want you you want to become a jazz player, a rock and roll player. Great. Don't forget that little rhythm that you used to play in your little village or whatever. Because that rhythm is yeah. or that manifestation is gonna make you unique. That's what makes you unique. There's an ocean of of players that play rock and roll or jazz very, very well. So what am I going to bring to the table? Am I going to be, I mean, chances are I'm just going to be a clone because we're, mm -hmm. we learn from the same sources, yeah, right? right? The same books, the same videos. So what is going to make me unique is, okay, I mean, just be yourself. Just be the guy from Caracas that used to play salsa, that used to play rock and roll, that used to, play classical music, just be that person. Ha put all that thing in your baggage and and, and take from it, you know. And, uh, do some administration, some accounting of those resources when you play yeah. and just be yourself. That's good. Um, so when I play jazz, uh, uh, like for instance, sometimes I'm playing in 4-4, four four, in our tradition, our cultural traditions, Four four coexists always with six or with three, so this the, that duality of of the of the triplet versus the binary feel, and uh, when we when I play six for instance, I interpret that six with a five feel, which is a f uh, a style of music from Venezuela, which is called merengue caraqueño, mm. which is in five eight. So I superimpose five over six. I can, uh, of course, I can do five over three if I'm playing a, a waltz. You know, so I, I do that I'm, all the time because it's, it's, it's natural yeah, for me. Yeah, natural, yeah. Uh, yeah. So when, when you do that, then, you know, the, the next natural progression would be, okay, so I can do, I can fit five in... In four, I can fit five and six. So let's try to do it with seven. Seven against four or seven against six. Wow. You know, you start compressing time that way. Yeah. Uh, or just work. One, one way of, 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 of bringing 
polyrhythmic um, uh, feel, for instance, is that. It's to fit, if you have six, to fit seven against that six, or I mean four, or fit five against this. Yeah. But another way is just to displace accents. So if you are like working with a pulse of, of quarter notes, for mm -hmm. instance, and then you just start, start displacing accents uh, in, in 16 instead of, uh, you, so you do a dotted eight, eight note. Okay. Bang, bang. So if you're here, bang, 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 bang. Right. And you create that your new pulse, for instance. Bang, 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 two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two. It, it becomes, yeah. I mean, so you, 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 you play with this. You know, when you're practicing, you set a metronome and, and you play. And of course, you have to, more ideally, if you have like drum patterns, because the drum pattern gives you a clear yeah, one. Indication, exactly. Yeah, indication, exactly. Yeah. So, because if you look with the metronome, sometimes you get lost right. and you think you're right. Yeah? yeah, and then you practice wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do it with a with a drum pattern, even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you just, you know, just uh, develop material based on that. You know, and then it types around. You can come. Uh, you you can do this displacement before yeah. you land, land back, back on in the one. Yeah. Etc. Yeah. Right. That's good. You beat me to the punch because I was gonna. The next question was gonna be what advice you had for aspiring musicians. You know, uh, that's one of the things that I, uh, this show specifically, I try and, and, and make sure that, you know, like the guests that, that I sit down with are able to share their knowledge, you know, with those that are trying to also get to, for example, your level, you know, of, of being able to play uh, different styles of music. Uh, I think one of the things uh, is that's most important when playing any style of music is playing it authentically, mm. you know, and the only way that one can do that is by studying those that you know, have done it well, you know, and continue mm. to do it well. Could you give an example? Could you tap or maybe, um, or maybe clap something uh, uh, where you do like something against 4-4? Four, four? Before I do that, yeah. uh, one, one important thing when you want to learn a, a, a style of music, when, first of all, try not to do it out of, I mean, it has to, it has to do something that really uh, that you really feel you yeah. need to, because you need to find the joy in this in this style. Right. When you do that from a financial point of view only, oh man, I'm gonna have more gigs because I play. If I play, you just you are starting in the wrong. You know. Yeah. I mean, culture is about the joy of knowing a way of thinking of, of a people, of yeah. a group of people. So, I don't, you know, I cannot view acquiring culture as a, from a, um, how do you say, a utilitarian. Right, monetary. Monetary, yeah. 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 No, I mean, it's, it has to really grow in you to really feel the joy to learn it. Right. Second, you do this by learning from the masters, of course, but you have to really first do it from respect of the culture. Mm -hmm. Love, joy, but also respect. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I see videos of, like, a, I was watching this video of a traditional cumbia ensemble in Colombia. And uh, that's a style, you know, I'm sure you have played cumbia before, but uh, you know that the originally this, the hi-hat, uh, that pattern comes from a maraca that is in this place, right? Have you seen it? No. It's I called haven't. the maracon. Okay. They call it the maracon. It's a huge maraca. One single maraca. And then the guy has, on this, on this, Side he has like a, a, a wind instrument, you know? So they swing the maraca, and then with his hand, he's playing his melody. Wow. The feel that that maraca gives 
cannot. Yeah. I mean, there's no hi hat that yeah. can recreate that. Yeah. And I'm watching these videos like, wow, it feels so good. I wish I could like, <laughs> you know, you just like add my piano to that. Yeah. You know. You know? Yeah. Uh, so it really, you really feel have to feel this emotion like this for the beauty of 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 of, of the of the culture. Right. And. Uh, respect the history you know really respect it and and and, and before you you focus in, in the masters that are doing it learn a little bit where it comes from where it comes from yeah. what what instruments replace what what we're listening to today comes from what the piano is a new thing it's a new addition so so what was there before the piano oh, right. the accordion or this or in merengue, Dominican merengue, they used to play with marimbula wow. you know, yeah. instead of bass. It's like this. It's this like archaic thing, box with just a few um, pieces of metal, right. and that that creates like a bass figure. You know? And you go like, wow, that's the original thing. That's the original box. Yeah, that created the sound. And yeah. So you you I, I find it amazing. You know just. To, find these things and, and to really fall in love with the, with the different cultures yeah, yeah so when it comes to the to the to the polyrhythmic thing uh you know the it's hard to do it with my you right, know because right, i do right. it on my lap yeah. you i'm thinking you're anything. just you're just another like you could do like a drummer you know whatever no no <laughs> I, don't, I don't have this kind of like this two limb thing sorry uh, i don't have this two uh but uh imagine learning uh, like if you're Tapping in four, mm -hmm. like if, if you have like three against this, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So you have three against two, isn't that similar to a, a, a horopo rhythm as well? A little bit, well, yeah, because, yeah. yeah, because again, our music is a result of the of the. Coexistence of, yeah. of of those the three against the two, right? Yeah. So when you have three against against two, about a uh, against a binary thing, then you have four, which is the subdivision of it, yeah. and then <laughs> five against or or. Six. Yeah. So going from the six to the five again. So if you learn to to subdivide everything in two, that's good. That's what that's a, a, a very good beginning. Yeah. To to be able to fill every subdivision against two. Uh, if you have the seven, for instance, you know that it's gonna be. Three hits, right. four hits, and in the middle of, and, and then, it, I mean, the two is gonna fall uh, right after the fourth hit. Yeah. In the middle, no? <laughs> right? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, no, so, good. so when when you practice that with the metronome, you create this. If I'm in in two. I'm going to play in three, for instance. Uh, you can create groups of four with this three. Mm. If you continue in three, it's too obvious, right? So, yeah. But if I go... Yeah. Then it's like <laughs> Where you, create, is it? <laughs> you create that that just by grouping them differently. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I I was wanted to see it firsthand. I I thought you know I I forgot that we didn't have the the piano because <laughs> it would have been cool, but um. Armando, thank you for your time. Appreciate thank you, you know, thank so you. much for 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 doing this, and uh, you know, appreciate the years that we've known each other, and just the advice and and yes. you know your your knowledge and wisdom. 
R- really appreciate it. Uh, you know, are still. We're still uh, striving. Yes, yes, we're still <laughs> never ends. Yeah, yes, that's yeah. the <laughs> that's the crude realization of what, what we do is that we never yep. we we never arrive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. still working at it. Still working. Yeah, at yeah, it. yeah. Guys, uh, this is episode number eight of Sir Kevin Says with Armado Ruiz. Thank you so much, Armado. Once Thank again. Thank you very much. Love for you very you. much, man. All Same right. You. Thank you. Welcome back, guys. Thank you for checking out episode number eight. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed it. One of my favorite parts is where I asked the model to demonstrate uh, playing against 4-4 four, four, using 3 or 5 or 6 or 7. And before he starts the demonstration, he says, I'm not much of a rhythm keeper. I'm not much of a drummer. But yet he proceeds to do exactly that. So just amazing to see uh, talent right in front of your eyes. Um, some stuff that, you know, it's really hard to do at times if you don't spend the time uh, practicing it. Um, episode number 9 comes out next Friday. I know that uh, the last couple of weeks I haven't released um, some episodes, but we are back to it, being that it's a new year, new me. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Uh, episode number nine comes out next week. Check it out. Let me know what you guys think.